Hi guys, it's Debbie. Another month came and went, so it's time to take a look at everything I watched this month. And of course, as always, I would love to hear what you've been watching, so make sure to leave a comment down below. Fun fact, this month I was actually part of the jury at a small horror film festival here in Italy, in Livorno. And I was on the jury for the short films, so I watched a bunch of uh, horror, sci-fi, thriller short films, but unfortunately, and understandably, the rules we were given included not talking about them. So I can't say how they were, of course, what vote I gave to them, but I can definitely say some people are incredibly creative in just a few minutes and on a very limited budget. But we have a video to make here, so let's get to what I can actually talk about. One of my favourite films of the month was Holy Spider by Ali Abbasi, a director I only discovered this summer when I watched another film of his, Border. Holy Spider is an absolutely terrifying crime thriller based on the true story of the so-called spider killer who targeted prostitutes working on the streets of Tehran in 2000. This film not only is visually stunning with a cinematography that drags you into the dark alleyways and staircases where the crimes take place, but it also covers a lot more than just the murders. It speaks about how the families of the victims react to the crimes, to the victims' profession, the general attitude towards sex workers and women as a whole, the way the police act or don't act, highly recommended. Another crime thriller I really liked is Anatomy of a Fall, which is going to be a big name at this winter's award season, especially for the main actress, Sandra Hula. In the film, she portrays a woman who lives in a remote mountain house with her husband and her son. One day, the husband is found dead under mysterious circumstances, and the film investigates what happened. I loved how this film defies expectations, is very down to earth with how investigations and courtroom sessions are carried out, and I will not say anything more to not spoil the plot for you, but I can definitely agree with all the praise Sandra Hula is receiving for her powerful performance. Moving on, I would like to share with you a funny coincidence by which I watched consecutively two very different films, both about um, the love for cars. <laughs> One is uh, Titan and the other is Paw Patrol the Mighty Movie. Paw Patrol was because we were taking a little member of the family to the cinema on a very special outing. We all enjoyed the film and I must say for being a movie targeted at preschoolers it had a better script and less plot holes compared to other films like the new Expendables. Anyway, Titan instead is an absurd, gory, bizarre body horror movie I don't know how to say this without spoilers. In the story, there are a series of brutal murders, but also a fireman reconnecting with his son and a woman who has a weird connection with cars and vehicles in general. I'm going to leave it for you to discover it on your own and trust me, it goes ways you would never have expected. But after all, it's from Julia Ducourneau who directed Raw, so we should have seen this coming. Next up, I watched Bottoms, a film I'd heard everybody speaking about very well, and I can confirm, it's very fun. It stars Ayo Edebiri and Rachel Sennett as two outcast high schoolers who end up creating um, a self-defense club, which then becomes a, a sort of fight club, all set up on a rickety premise of lies and trying to impress the girls they like. Accidents and misunderstandings lead to more accidents and misunderstandings, and overall it feels like a fun old-school teen comedy. Then I finally watched Battle Royale, a film that had been sitting on my watch list for the longest time possible, and it didn't disappoint. Even here we have high schoolers, but in this case they are taken off to a remote island where they have to fight against each other until death. This is because the government wants to curb teenage delinquency and they take these drastic measures. The kids are given a set of tools and rules and they're split into couples and set off into the wild. Factions are created, some are more violent, others are just trying to survive, some get very creative. It's a really gripping film and it was interesting to read the production process. For example, the fact that uh, Toei refused to sell the, uh, the film to any American distributor for like over a decade because they were so terrified of the potential lawsuits because of the controversial nature of the film. I then watched Rotten in the Sun and what a trip it was. It's the story of an artist who's going through a rough patch in life. He's struggling with depression, keeping up with his work, and his housemaid seems to make everything always more difficult for him instead of helping him. Anyway, he's reached the point of having some very dark thoughts and a friend of his recommends visiting this uh, a um, famous gay beach in Mexico. And at this beach, he meets a guy, and the plot is a roller coaster from there. So many chaotic situations occur. The story goes nowhere where you would have expected. You have to watch this, it's so good. Another good film I watched was Sick of Myself, the story of a narcissistic couple in which um, the 
the, the, the two people are always trying to overshadow one another. He's a famous artist and she's always jealous of the attention he receives, the interviews, the friends. And so she comes up with always more complicated, convoluted lies about herself in order to appear more interesting. And when she has nothing more to invent, she makes herself physically very sick in order to draw the attention and compassion to herself. It's a very sad, twisted, dark comedy which shows what people are willing to do for attention. And I wouldn't be surprised by people coming up with ideas like this in this current internet fame era. While I'm on this point, this month I actually also watched Nerve, a not particularly good film starring Emma Roberts and Dave Franco. But what is interesting is that it's from seven years ago where we still, I mean, th there were internet challenges, but we still weren't into this absolutely obsessive behavior for likes and uh, internet fame. And in the film, the two protagonists play a game by which people online challenge them to do always crazier things, which at the time, seven years ago, sounded so dystopic and nasty, and which unfortunately now is just ordinary business. Then on my list, unfortunately, we have the absolutely atrocious The Ritual Killer starring Morgan Freeman and which perfectly fits the description of Can We Watch Seven? We have Seven at home. It's so bad. It's the story of a serial killer who, as the title implies, commits his crimes in a very ritualistic manner. But don't worry, it's not a mystery until the end. We know who, who the killer is. And Morgan Freeman, an anthropologist, seems to be the only person on planet Earth who can help solve this case, all with unrealistic dialogues, awful pace, school play level sets and a wannabe creepy vibe which just doesn't work. Another serial killer film which luckily was better was Totally Killer which I actually watched two times this month as I rewatched it with my mum. I'm just going to admit it, I would have loved this as a teenager. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's clearly made for a younger audience. It's the story of a high schooler who ends up traveling back in time and tries to stop a serial killer from murdering a group of girls. So she has to come up with all sorts of ways to stop them from going to the events where they get murdered. This affects the timeline. She has to not reveal who she really is. It's a light horror comedy, which was perfect for the Halloween period. I actually didn't watch that many horrors this month. Um, one I watched was no one will save you which wasn't too bad at least it's um, completely different from a lot of other titles that have been released recently firstly because basically there is no dialogue throughout the whole film and second it brings back the old school aliens on planet earth concept as a matter of fact the protagonist is a young woman caitlin deva whose house is attacked by aliens and who needs to try to escape and survive basically all on her own the other horror i watched was it lives inside a film for which everybody was so excited and the film was released and everybody quickly sat back down in their seats it's not awful but i think people were expecting the most innovative and great demon film of the last decade. It's the story of an Indian American teenager and her longtime friend who released a demonic entity and to understand it and stop it she needs to discover her own Indian culture, the legends and stories her family believes and a part of identity she had been trying to hide in favour of just her American one. I agree with the review saying if you've seen the boogeyman you've seen this film. In general, it's not particularly groundbreaking, interesting, different. The most interesting aspect was hearing about all the Indian legends about the demon. Speaking of demons, but well portrayed ones, I once again rewatched Constantine. This film is so good. I've watched it countless times and I can't wait for the sequel that's supposedly in the works again with Keanu Reeves. In this film, demons and angels are on planet Earth. They walk amongst us disguised as normal people. And the protagonist is an exorcist who can see them and interact with them, something which is draining him along with other problems he's dealing with. One day he's called to investigate a bizarre suicide and he discovers there is much more to it. If you haven't seen this film yet, run to watch it. I think that's it for the horrors, unless you consider Come to Daddy a horror. It's a very, very bizarre film starring Elijah Wood um, as a hipster, I guess we can call him that, who travels uh, to visit his estranged father who lives in the middle of nowhere and a lot more happens in that house. Some scenes are absolutely weird and frightening, others make you want to laugh out loud on the screen. 
it, it was an experience. I then watched Diana, one of the many titles um, I've seen about Princess Diana, but maybe one of the most underwhelming. I definitely preferred her portrayal by different actresses in The Crown or by Kristen Stewart and Spencer, but this film does cover a side of her life which isn't often portrayed in media, and that is her relationship with Hasnat Khan before the more famous uh, um, Dodi Fayed. Although it's not covered that much in media, many say he was her one true love, that her relationship with Fayed was just to make Khan jealous, she had even travelled to Pakistan to meet his family, but I guess we'll never know the whole truth. Next up is Sound of Freedom, one which quickly became the most controversial of the whole year, uh, both for the plot itself and the whole production process. Sound of Freedom is based on the real story of a former CIA agent who founded an organization trying to save trafficked people. In the film, he is shown trying to bring home a group of children caught in a multinational net of child trafficking. It's unfortunately a disgusting reality, and I don't think the plot itself was too awful in portraying it, but be prepared for a very big. What the fuck is the and also it's very heavy on the Christian side, on faith, on God always being there, on God forgiving you, on having to put family first, which split audiences, and then there was production process. I am not too informed about the whole situation, but from what I gathered, this guy was then actually accused of being a QAnon uh, cons conspirator of uh, uh, sexual misconduct. He was kicked out of his own church. As you can tell, I'm not too informed, but you can understand there is a a big chaos around in this film. Then I watched Finding Your Feet, a film which completely surprised me. I expected it just to be a um, silly comedy about an elderly woman who breaks up with her husband and uh, ends up on fun adventures with a lot of stereotypical jokes. Instead, it went on a completely different path about the importance of friendships and those few people close to you you can really count on, the fact that being old doesn't mean your life is over, about having fun on your own. Somebody perfectly described this film as a coming of age story, but at an age in which people uh, assume your life is just settled. Completely unexpected, and it really made me cry. Instead of more standard coming of age film I watched this month was an Italian film, Amanda, starring Benedetta Porcaroli, who is one of those names we are just going to see everywhere in the next few years. In the film, she portrays a very moody teenager who has everything in her wealthy life, but who's perennially bored and annoyed with everybody and everything. She lives in her own world and she basically only really hangs out with her housemate. But one day she decided to reconnect with her old best friend. Some say it's the Italian ladybird and if you're looking for a setting which isn't the usual Amalfi Coast and Pizza Pasta Mandolino, this could be an interesting choice. Actually somebody said that Amanda would perfectly fit in a Wes Anderson movie, so on that note I actually watched The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, Wes Anderson's new film. It's actually a, a short film, it's around 40 minutes long, based on a Roald Dahl story I didn't know about. It's a non-stop, fast-paced narration of this wealthy Henry Sugar who learns about a man who can see without using his eyes, but the film presents it as th this story of Henry Sugar who finds a book, and in the book there's a doctor who visits this man who then tells a story about he met a guru, and so on. It's a story within a story within a story, it in, and the theatrical style, pure Wes Anderson style, it really fills in the gaps. So you, you glue to the screen until the end. And I was actually forgetting that this month I watched Killers of the Flower Moon, Martin Scorsese's highly awaited new film. I won't go too in depth on this as there's a full standalone review of the film on my channel, I will leave that linked. But it's the sad true story of a series of murders of Native Americans on an oil rich land after many white people arrived to do business in the area. It features is a pretty impressive cast, but I loved, for example, lesser known names like Lily Gladstone compared to a De Niro or a DiCaprio. And I think it's a technically well put together film, which definitely didn't need to last three and a half hours, but I'll leave the full review link. I then watched Fair Play, the new Netflix film everybody's talking about. And I'm going to say something which might sound a little controversial, but I have this feeling that a lot of the new content Netflix is putting out is mostly targeted at a younger audience. Not everything, but understandably, if their fan base is mostly younger audiences, they're highly likely not going to go looking for a 1960s niche classic movie they could usually only find a movie. And I think Fair Play is a bit of a bait for that age group. It's what would be one of their first films featuring adults, couples fighting over power dynamics, marriage, high-end jobs. There is 
rough sex, shouting, you get what I mean, it's not bad, but it's nothing groundbreaking. Also, period blood doesn't look like that. I then watched The Buddha, a documentary narrated by none other than uh, Richard Gere, which covers the origins of Buddhism, in particular the life of Siddhartha Gautama, who then became the Buddha. Again, nothing groundbreaking, but if you want an overview of his beliefs and the origins of Buddha, it's a good place to start. I then rewatched L'Ultima Notte di Amore, an Italian film which I absolutely adored at the cinema, but which didn't excite me as much on at home. It stars Pier Francesco Favino, basically one of the most popular Italian actors working at the moment, and he portrays a policeman who ends up in a lot of mess right on the last night of of his career, of his service. I think on the big screen the urban setting really popped and also I definitely had less issues with understanding what the characters were saying. They all speak with very very strong southern accents which sometimes are more like dialects so the words are completely different from Italian and at the cinema at least they were loud and clear but at home it all sounded like a low mumbled mess. The story in itself is still good though. I then watched Ali starring Will Smith as Cassius Clay, the world famous boxer, um, who then chose the name of Muhammad Ali. I didn't know much about his life or career, I knew he had converted to Islam but that was about it, so it was interesting to see everything explained right from the beginning, his ties to Malcolm X, his partners, his political ideas, and last but not least I watched Loose, uh, an interesting story about a promising high schooler whose perfect image is challenged by one of his teachers who believes he has a different agenda from from what he puts out there. His parents are involved, other students and teachers have to give their side of the story, and as we don't know what the truth is right until the end, it also allows us to form our own opinion as the film moves on. But with that we have reached the end of today's list. Of course I would love to hear what you've been watching, what you thought about all these titles I spoke about today, so make sure to leave a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!